our panel has more examples of how these factors affect your health. And so I am happy to introduce our panelists, very esteemed panelists. I'm going to start at the end with Crystal Crawford. Crystal Crawford is Chief Executive Officer of the California Black Women's Health Project, which carries out legislative, educational, and policy advocacy to improve the health of California's black women and girls. A graduate of Dartmouth College and New York University Law School, Ms. Crawford is admitted to the bar in California, New York, and New Jersey. Got a brain <laughs> In 2009, she received the Advocates Award from the Western Center on Law and Policy, one of California's leading advocacy organizations fighting for health care and a strong safety net for low-income Californians. Welcome, Crystal. Our next panelist is Francisco Oaxaca. Mr. Oaxaca was appointed Director of Public Affairs of First 5 LA in December 2010. First 5 LA is a unique child advocacy organization created by California voters to invest tobacco tax revenues in programs for improving the lives of Los Angeles County children from prenatal through age five. Its vision is to create a future throughout communities where all young children are born healthy and raised in a loving and nurturing environment so that they grow up healthy, are eager to learn, and reach their full potential. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Lark Galloway Gilliam. And I think we're next, Lark. I can't the story. Yes, I'll this afternoon. Lark Galloway Gilliam is Executive Director of Community Health Councils, a Los Angeles based health non profit dedicated to building healthy communities. During her tenure at Community Health Councils, MS, Galloway Gilliam has played an active role in policy development on issues that include expansion of healthcare coverage for children and families. She also supports preservation and quality improvement of healthcare of the healthcare safety net, environmental justice, and the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities. Thank you very much. And our la last but not least is Dr. Gabriel Crenshaw. I think you're better known as Dr. Gabe, is yeah, that right? Or Dr. Right. Gabe? <laughs> um, Dr. Crenshaw is an educator, speaker, songwriter, and a radio and television personality. He is a doctor of clinical psychology with an emphasis in multicultural community. He has committed his life to observing and understanding the humanity that unites us all. Over the last several years, he has dedicated his studies and profession, sorry, profession, to finding ways of creating basic human connections in every corner of the globe. Please welcome our panelists. <laughs> We're going to start by giving our panelists um, two to three minutes just to give an overview of their work and to present to us uh, some of the ideas that we as journalists should be looking at. So I'd like to start with Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be with you. Um, bringing you greetings from the staff and board of the California Black Women's Health Project. We are, we are celebrating our 17th anniversary as the only statewide organization solely devoted to improving the health of California's black women and girls through policy, advocacy, education, and outreach. Um, the work we do is really around, I think this mic is going in now, huh? The work we do is really centered around engaging community in advocacy. And we, at the Black Women's Health Project, include our media brothers and sisters as part of our community. And really understand that for us to be able to be effective in improving the health of our community, We've really got to be systemic um, in our approach, and we've also got to be building a movement, a movement that includes 
policy makers, a movement that includes community members, that includes journalists as part of the same extended family. So the work that we do, the reason I was excited to be here today, is really to um, give you all a sense of how we think at the Black Women's Health Project, our partnership between us and, and the media can really be strengthened in order to help build our movement to improve health. Um, and, and one of the things I want to talk about is in the context of this you know, intersection between education and job and income and how all those things impact our health. I know some of the other panels will go into more detail about that specifically. But in terms of framing the work and how we move, to get, move forward together to do the work, at the Black Women's Health Project, we combine what we call vertical advocacy and horizontal advocacy. Okay? So vertical advocacy is your traditional policy advocacy. How do we... Um, put pressure on and influence our legislators to make decisions that will improve our health, right? Put legislation in place that will improve our health, use resources in ways that will improve our health. So that's the vertical piece, right? Holding them accountable for serving us. The horizontal piece is really around the community health education. How do we hold each other accountable for being good stewards of our own health and each other's health as a community? So we use a unique approach that's a hybrid of this kind of vertical and horizontal advocacy. And where we could use uh, more help from both the media and the community in improving health outcomes in, in our community is really around getting folks to see the importance of using both of those strategies simultaneously. Most folks are usually uh, focused on using one or the other as their primary method of influencing change, right? Either they're focused on policy advocacy or they're focused on the community health education piece. And we really feel like we all have to be engaged in both. Um, one of the things we always say that in policy advocacy, it's really important for people who are delivering service to actually be part of the advocacy. So often, service delivery folks are so busy meeting the needs of Mrs. Jones and her daughter and you know, son down the street that they don't really have the time to engage in the vertical advocacy, the policy advocacy. But those are the exact voices that we need to hear from that we need to have engaged in that advocacy because those are folks that can tell the stories that stick with legislators that make them say, aha, I remember that story Ms. Jones told about how this issue impacted the other people that she was working with and it really does make a difference. So for us in framing this work around community health and the intersection of education and jobs and income and where we live and how we live, it's really around building an effective movement that integrates vertical advocacy and horizontal advocacy. And the way that you all as journalists can help us do that is to look at your stories that same way. To, as you talk about an issue that's much more of a policy advocacy issue, a vertical advocacy issue, make sure that you are bringing out and talking about the horizontal advocacy implications of that particular issue. Meaning the stories of how people's lives have been impacted, how um, individual folks have been changed by the way policies have been either well implemented or not implemented so well, right? And or if it's a story that's much more around the horizontal advocacy piece, that is really around telling you know, a story of how someone's life is improved um, or been harmed in some way, that we also take an opportunity to do issue education, right? To, to not necessarily, I don't know you don't want to lobby through your article, I'm not trying to get you all to, to do that through your news stories, but to use it as an issue education opportunity to see every, um, every issue that we deal with has policy implications and to make sure that we are helping to familiarize folks with those policy implications, both the upsides and downsides, right? Not trying to get you to pitch one side or the other of the issue, but really to put the information out there so that folks can be informed and understand the um, implications of, of public policy in their everyday lives. Um, the last thing I'll share, because I'm sure I'm about my three minutes now, aren't I? Um, the last thing I'll share is really, we have a Black Women's Mental Health Initiative. And so we look at how mental health intersects with every single issue that we work on. And we just are charging all of our brothers and sisters in the movement, um, le um, legislators, policymakers, um, journalists, to make sure that every story that we tell, we talk about the mental and emotional health implications of that story so that we begin to destigmatize this notion of mental and emotional health and normalize this discussion and recognize that there's no way that you can be a person of color living in America and not have some emotional and mental health residuals from living in a society that is, you know, inundating you with uh, systemic racism implications and, and issues. So it's, it's really important that we do that as a, as a community, as a movement, integrate mental health 
um, integrate reproductive health and reproductive rights and justice into the work, make sure we're putting women's issues front and center in the work that we do. And, um, and of course, this education piece, I can talk more about that later, but I just wanted to really frame, those are some of the important framing issues for us that I think will help us be more effective in the work we do, and hopefully help you all tell stories that get people more excited to join our movement and to do the advocacy work that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with all of you and, and have a chance to, to share what we do at, at First Live LA and to be part of this, of this outstanding panel. The health issues of children from birth to five are probably not as newsworthy as we'd like them to be, and we understand that, especially when compared to stories that affect older children and adults. However, at First Five LA, we are, we are completely convinced that it is those early years of a child's life that really form the foundation for future development and success. I mean, these are really crucial years. And as we've already heard from some of the other panelists today, um, if these children are born in poorer neighborhoods, um, the, the odds are against them already. Uh, they will not have the same access to health care, uh, parks, playgrounds, nutritious food, uh, as those children in wealthier communities. Raising a family in these neighborhoods uh, where these resources are not available is a significant challenge. And at First Five LA, one of our chief missions is to find the best ways to serve these parents and their young children uh, throughout Los Angeles County. Uh, I'd like to spend a minute just giving all of you some background about First Five LA because uh, we are a little bit unique in this field and sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to get a, a clear idea of what our role is. Back in 1998, I'm sure some of you remember, Proposition 10 was passed, and it was uh, it authorized a tax on tobacco products in the state to fund the health, safety, and early education efforts uh, in each county for children, basically from prenatal years, age zero to age five. Each of the 58 counties in California has a first five commission that administers funds from uh, Proposition 10 uh, sales tax on tobacco products. The money is apportioned based on each county's birth rate. And Los Angeles County, with the highest birth rate of any county in the state, receives the largest proportion of those funds. Since 1998, First Five LA has invested about a billion dollars in communities across Los Angeles County in such efforts such as healthy births programs that provide services to pregnant women and home visitation programs that probably have a significant effect on keeping children out of foster care or from being exposed to neglect or abuse. We have also funded programs such as clinics that provide uh, poor black and Latino youngsters access to oral health care. To make our decisions, we spend a significant amount of time and effort uh, doing research and conducting our own studies to determine the specific needs of pregnant women throughout LA County and their young children. Then we carefully select the best qualified organizations uh, to provide grants to, to implement the different programs that have been designed. We also partner with hospitals, universities, and other uh, county departments. Throughout the duration of these grants, we monitor very closely the operation of our grantees, and we also, if needed, provide them with technical assistance to be able to provide the services more efficiently and more effectively. And then there's always a very important step of evaluating the effectiveness of these programs to determine whether we need to change directions or not in any way. But the bottom line is if we are ever to see the change that we're trying to achieve, um, there really needs to be an awareness in the general public of the importance of these investments in the health and the education and the safety of our youngest children, how critical they are. Uh, for instance, there is still a persistent higher rate of mortality of black infants in our communities. And the epidemic of tooth decay and obesity amongst our youngest children in our communities is continuing to worsen. One way that First Five LA is trying to be innovative in identifying approaches that will increase the effectiveness of our investments is our place-based initiative, which we call Best Start. It is a key component of our new strategic plan that focuses on comprehensive efforts to improve the lives of young children in neighborhoods of high need. We have identified 14 communities throughout LA County, 
and we are bringing together all the important stakeholders from parents, civic leaders, educators, healthcare professionals, the clergy. Together what we hope to do is help them create an environment that supports the growth and development of the young children in their community while strengthening and taking advantage of existing community resources. Where a child grows up does matter. The stronger the community, the stronger the family, the stronger the child will be. And as we already have some examples today, we have some of our, our younger adults who are now ready to step into leadership roles. And we believe that if the process of preparing them for their future begins as early as possible, uh, we have a much better chance of these youth being able to take leadership roles in their communities and be able to advocate for those in their community to identify the appropriate needs and to advocate for getting those needs met in their communities. Our research shows that this type of investment is actually more effective and more efficient at leveraging resources and reaching more of the children we're trying to reach. Um, under our previous strategies, we were reaching somewhere in the area of around 70,000 of our youngest children with our Best Start initiatives we will reach over 160,000 of those children in our communities. That means that we can reach nearly 20% of the most vulnerable population of children zero to five. We believe this is a more comprehensive approach and will actually work towards strengthening families in our communities and allows us to better target and coordinate and integrate our services in those communities of the highest need. As we know, the economic turmoil that our communities are going through is significant. And we have, believe we have found a way to most effectively target our investments to assist in these communities. Um, the goals are ambitious. Our four goals that are part of our strategic plan are that children are born healthy, they maintain a healthy weight, they are safe from abuse and neglect, and they are ready for kindergarten. But we know that through our place-based approach, um, we will be able to be successful, but only with the participation of the members of the communities to help us identify what they see as the most important needs and to become the advocates for themselves. But almost most importantly, we also need the support of our partners in the communities, and that includes those of you in the media. Uh, we count on you, and we will continue to count on you to be the voice and the ears of the communities that we're trying to serve. So I look forward to speaking to you today, and, and I'll be looking forward to your questions as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Lark Galloway Gilliam, Executive Director of Community Health Council. We're a nonprofit health advocacy and policy organization. We don't do direct services, and it's very intentional. Um, we are there to really try to inform, engage, and mobilize communities around policy and systems change. We are convinced that the health disparities, the inequalities we see in our community a result of not individual behavioral problems, and then that clearly that's there, it's the conditions in which people find themselves living and, and growing and, and uh, working. Our primary focus is South Los Angeles, which is where we're located within the um, Crenshaw District. And that area is of particular concern to us because it is the area with the highest percentage of African American population in the region. It is also distinguished by the area with the highest rates of heart disease, diabetes, educational failure. Um, you go down the list, it's pervasive. But if we, we, we want to always remember and to look at that community in the context of what is happening in terms of local policy, state policy, and national policy. We're very much persuaded by the fact that in South Los Angeles where you see the highest, or I should say the lowest life expectancy, we've got to uncover why that is occurring. It's not by accident. A lot of our work centers around the built environment. In 2008, I think we produced one of the first analysis of the correlation between public policy and the health disparities we see in our community. We look not just simply at the healthcare system, which is a, a contributing factor, the fact that we find disparities in the health care that communities we see. We find that in areas like South Los Angeles, we have fewer hospitals and fewer doctors, and the list goes on, and less funding for those that we do have. But when you look at the built environment, when you look at the fact that this is an area in which you find some of the uh, most significant number of brownfields, 
where you find some of the oldest and um, less investments in terms of schools, where you find fewer grocery stores and parks, and where you find yourself with the largest urban oil field. We began to ask ourselves, why is this happening in this community? Why is there this kind of neglect? I would dare say that um, the challenge that you face as reporters, particularly looking at it, the world from the African American and black perspective is, how do we talk about racism in this country? And I, and I realize that particularly when you're engaged in mainstream media, that's a very difficult thing to do. We don't like that word in this country. We don't want to talk about it, and yet it is pervasive. We've moved into a situation where structural racism is really killing our population. And it's so hard to unveil. It's so hard to talk about. And so if I think that there's any challenge for you as reporters, I think it really is about that. How do you look at what is happening at the federal level right now around the deficit reduction act? Sounds really great. But they're dismantling the social service network, the safety nets for our population. They're raising the age of social security when we know that our communities really do rely on that as their source of retirement and survival. They're talking about taking away Head Start, which has done so much for the black communities and brown black, advancing children's education. We have to ask why. We have to be able to talk about this in a way that um, engages and mobilizes and infuriates our community so that people are awakened to the need to stand up and do something different. So much of our work centers around that. We Right now we're taking on the fast food industry. They have, after the 92 riots, we were supposed to grocery stores. Instead we got McDonald's and Burger King's and, and you look at their advertisement, and then you turn around and say, yes, and look at the African-American community. They're so obese, how these terrible, lazy people. When you look at our neighborhoods, and that's all you find, you have to ask yourself why, and what can we do about it? And I don't believe these things really happen by accident. And so it's how do we, how do we talk about that? How do we create the level of accountability that Mary was talking about earlier, not just within our elected um, community, but in corporate America as well? And that is a lot of what we try to do increasingly as an organization. I know this panel wants to talk more largely about not only the healthcare system, but the educational system and the employment situation. You look at communities like South Los Angeles in which um, there's not a lot of development going on. And you, you know, they're not bringing jobs into our community. You have to ask yourself, why would a company, even my poster child uh, companies, why would a company like, called Symtech, is that doing that right? It's the virus protection company uh, for software. Symantec. Symantec. I'm great with names. That's why I have a four, le four letters in my name. Um, <laughs> they built their offices in Culver City, overlooking the freeway entrance, on top of a um, sewer scrubber system, rather than someone having a presence of mind and saying, let's bring those jobs into South Los Angeles. We are becoming this. I tell people, we're like a work camp. We have to leave our communities. They're even building trains to move us from our community to other areas. And no one's challenging that. I think we have to challenge our elected officials. We have to understand that unemployment, the crisis in our community is a result of lack of jobs. We have to talk about the educational system and how that's feeding into the prison systems. We really have to find a way of talking about these, linking it to race, and calling it out. And I know it's difficult, but that is on my heart today, is the, the challenge that you face as reporters to work with us in figuring out how do we do this together, because that's the only thing that's going to change the course of health in our community. Thank you. Okay, so, um, hello, everybody. Um, Bob, thanks a lot. I appreciate this opportunity to be on the board of this panel. Now, you know, I usually don't like to do things like this because you, usually the people you're talking to, they're already in your choir. <laughs> and so it's kind of like we're just going to church. Uh, but uh, there is a lot here, and I've already gleaned a lot from you guys. And let me just say, uh, now that I've stepped over to the media side, um, I do understand, I'm understanding even more so both sides. I'm a psychologist and I'm an educator. And now I guess I'm an on-air television doctor. Like I play a doctor on TV, but like I'm 
for real adopted. <laughs> so, um, and there is a difference. Um, I lecture a lot. Before I started doing TV, I lectured a lot. You know, and what I find is, is that there are three things that I want to say. This is what I've often told students, and my landscape is the world. I no longer just see just black people. Because if you travel around the world, you cannot just see black people. And if you go to Africa, South Central looks like Beverly Hills in certain parts, you know? And so our level of poverty and what we see and how we, um, our level of access and all of these things, uh, I'm starting to believe, uh, my perception about it is changing. And there are sort of three things I just want to say real quick um, to introduce you to me. Um, one is, is we're more than this. We are more than this. Um, the cultural problem that you see, uh, the lack of education, the lack of, uh, you know, the obesity, the diabetes, we're more than that. So I would challenge reporters, when you're walking into a culture of poverty, South Central, wherever it is, you have to really walk in and see that the people that you might talk to whose house just burned down or there was a gang shooting or whatever the, you know, the typical format is, that these people are more than this. So then it moves to perception. There's something called the Rosenthal effect that what you believe to be true about someone is actually what will manifest. And um, our perception about our, the stereotypes, we call them heuristics, whether they're representative or available, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think black people South Central, if you're a reporter, there's already something in your mind, even if you are a black reporter or a Latino reporter, especially if you no longer live in South Central, you were already thinking, oh, wow, you know, got to be careful, I need a breastplate to uh, get, you know, whatever, and, you know, call your homies and try to, you know, get big and back being boo or something. But, uh, and then there's trust. You want the people to talk to you, and I think in the black community, we will trust. If we trust you, we'll tell you our story. My challenge is always, and Beverly White does an outstanding job with this. And she always has, I've known Beverly since Cincinnati. Black people will get in front of a camera and talk. They'll talk with the, in the 80s, they talked with a plastic bag on their head because they didn't want their curl to, you know, dry out. In the 90s, they talked with a bandana on their head because they wanted to represent. In 2000, they're still sagging and they will talk in front of the camera because, hey, they get to be up and did you see me with sight? And I say, Find the people in that community who actually know their ABCs. They are there. You don't want to focus on the people who have the invisibility syndrome. It's the, if you feel invisible in the world, what are you doing to try to get the attention? So a camera comes in and you get to tell your story, but you are embarrassing the very people that you say you want to represent. And in and of itself, it's not necessarily their fault because it's all that they know. So the challenge is, is how do we educate? Uh, how do we take on personal responsibility? And when there's one more thing I want to say, I forget what the last point was. The <laughs> five I keeps going out. Um, I guess I'll say the rest of these things later, but education uh, affects our health. Uh, people who have a decreased education um, have. Uh, uh, fewer resources when it comes to jobs. Uh, I'll talk about some stats, a 2000 uh, report where, when in 1998, 44% of non-Hispanic and black Americans age 65 and over had graduated from high school, but only 7% had a bachelor's degree. Education really is the way out because you learn more things. It changes your perception. It challenges the fundamental thoughts of who you thought you were. Poverty is, is about dollars and cents. Because it goes untapped, and we don't, we, don't, we don't teach our children things that don't cost money, right? Things that don't cost money. You, you can teach your child how to count, how to do their ABCs, et cetera. There's a lot of things that we don't have to wait for school to happen. But uh, you don't know these things necessarily, and we, we're operating in communities trying to tell their story. And honestly, it's just exacerbated, and everybody's just frustrated. And a lot of times, I think we're just running away trying to make sure we don't become them. And I say, we are them. I am them, and they are me. 
And when you start to see it that way, it changes because when they get on television and they start to talk in, in Beverly's camera, or actually Beverly won't use them, she'll find someone who actually can actually put a sentence together and probably encourage that person who can't, you know, go to school and come back and I'll use you again. Uh, but um, I think that's where we, we start, at least on my end, because as a psychologist, I'm really about changing the perception, getting at the root of it, and realizing that there's a brilliance that's in all of us. Uh, and it's not color, ethnic, dependent. It just is because we're born that way.